In the evolving consciousness of humanity, the eternal quest for freedom has inspired men and women through the ages to defy accepted limitations and take a giant step forward against what seemed to be insurmountable odds. The Great American Revolution began in the 1600s in Scrooby, England, with an inspired group of people who challenged their king. This evolution has yet to play out its finest hour. Visionary leaders have bridged great gulfs of differences to walk in peace. The Mayflower Compact brought unity to the 102 Mayflower passengers and articulated principles of respect and choice upon which a great nation was founded. I'm Connie Baxter Marlowe, and I'm descended from five passengers on the Mayflower who came over here in the early 1600s and who drafted the Mayflower Compact in the hold of this little ship. The Mayflower Compact was drawn up on the Mayflower. Under these circumstances, as described by Governor William Bradford, this day, before we came to harbor, observing some not well affected to unity and concord, but gave some appearance of faction, it was thought good there should be an association and agreement that we should combine together in one body, and to submit to such government and governors as we should by common consent agree to make and choose. At their first meeting, Wampanoag Sachem, Massasoit, and the Pilgrim leaders drafted an agreement that embodied the principles found in the Mayflower Compact and guided their peoples in peace and friendship for an entire generation, giving birth to the American mind and a new era of possibility. Henry David Thoreau, 200 years later, in Concord, Massachusetts, wrote his great civil disobedience. He went to jail just like the Mayflower Pilgrims and Scrooby went to jail for what they believed in. And Thoreau called upon each of us to walk according to our conscience, to live according to our hearts. My name is Henry Thoreau. I was born in Concord, Massachusetts, and for the last year and a half I've been living here in my one-room house at Walden Pond. While Thoreau was living at Walden Pond, it was a very busy and significant period of time for Thoreau while he was living at Walden Pond again between 1845 and 1847, it was also the period of time, in addition to going to Katahdin, he also went uh, into town one day to have a shoe repaired and was uh, arrested and thrown into jail for failure to pay his taxes. This past summer I decided that I was going to stand up for my rights as a citizen of the United States by withholding my poll tax from the village of Concord and therefore the state of Massachusetts. So civil disobedience is something that's extraordinarily serious, or it can be. Um, and what Thoreau's response to the serious, that level of seriousness appears to be is that you must basically rely less on the world and rely more on yourself. I have come to the pond to live as simply as I can. Uh, I feel that if you have a lot of uh, possessions, a lot of material goods, that really you are not as, as free as you could be. How do you fashion a life where you can live as the particular person that you want yourself to be? By following my conscience, by doing what I think right at any time, I am already uh, a majority because the individual is the one that has all of the power. Basically, his Declaration of Independence, Walden, uh, was a declaration of personal independence as opposed to social or governmental independence. So he was basically taking the, I believe, the principles, the fundamental principles and spirit of the American Revolution and bringing it down to an individual level. And this identity evolved out of the of, out of the fermentation of ideas between the founding documents of this nation, the Constitution, 
the Bill of Rights. Thoreau famously stayed at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days between 1845 and 1847. About halfway during uh, Thoreau's stay at the pond, he went to the Maine woods, his first trip to the Maine woods, and climbed uh, Mount Katahdin, the highest uh, peak in the state of Maine. And it's interesting to see what he has to say. There's, he, has, he actually has quite a, ver a long uh, passage about it, but what I'd like to do is just read what I regard as the most critical component of this long passage. It's, among thorough scholars, it's, it's fair, fairly well known as the contact passage, and you'll see why in a moment. I stand in awe of my body, he writes. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, but I fear bodies, I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries, think of our life and nature, daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it. Rock, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense. Contact, contact, who are we? Where are we? This is kind of, I think for Thoreau, this is kind of a seminal experience, this, an experience that you have out in the world that gets you down to some of the most foundational, fundamental questions, questions that even involve who you are, questions of identity, uh, epistemology, I mean, again, some of the most philosophically basic questions. The spirit of the mountain is always there, and it draws people there. It draws people that comes there who are non-Indians, and they don't know the reason why they are drawn there, but they are drawn there because of the spirit, the spirit of the mountain. The heart of Walden, the really important part, comes later with the exploration of the inward morning, to use, you know, the inward journey, the inward voyage. It's all inward, it's all spiritual, it's all at that level of the higher law that really is important for Thoreau. When you talk about law as opposed to conscience, what you are really talking about is, is higher laws. It's an ethical awakening. He's not talking about a, a physical awakening and getting up in the morning and raising your head out of the bed. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the effort, as he puts it, to throw off sleep, moral lethargy, the effort to become truly alive. To be awake is to be alive. I have never yet met a man who is quite awake. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn. As a human being, as a person on this earth, I have a certain uh, ingrained divinity, a certain truth that is inside each and every living creature. Uh, you can call it truth, you can call it conscience, you can call it intuition, you may call it what you will, but that is that divine spark inside all of us. And we all know basic truths. We all know truth, we all know beauty, we all know love. Even if we were deaf, dumb, and blind, we would know what those things are. The, the Creator has put this spirit in all of us. It seems to be more, it seems to be more pronounced and prevalent in the Indian ways but everybody has it, no matter what color, shape, form you may be, you have that, and that's this, how this body holds it. Uh, it is just as important to study the Indians. They are divine as well, and we can learn a great deal from the way that the Indian has lived here in our land, their respect for nature, their use of the land, uh, their belief that we are all part of the Great Spirit, that the Great Spirit created the world for our use, but also for us to live in harmony with the world around us. Uh, it is something that we need to learn as an American people, as we expand westward. It is something we need to learn as a modern civilization, that the uh, native civilizations that were here before us are worth studying and worth learning from. You have Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, you have Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a correspondence between the two, and Thoreau is attempting to leverage that correspondence to basically make his own essay a scripture. What does it mean to be religious today? What does it mean to be spiritual today? What does it mean to be a free society today? A free society has to be a responsible society. And we as Americans have a major responsibility 
in the global scene today. It is therefore important for us as Americans of all stripes and all religions to kind of look at our deepest selves and say, what are we about as Americans? What is it that makes America great? What are the principles on which this country was founded? Perhaps it's time now to understand that this country was founded by inspired individuals, people who listened to this higher voice, acted according to it, put their lives on the line, and brought us great freedom that we enjoy today. And it's up to us now as to where we'll take that freedom, what we'll do with it. Are we going to, to keep it going in its evolutionary upward spiral and take it from the pilgrims, from Thoreau, from the native people, and come together in our hearts and, and bring a world of profound freedom onto the planet. In 1783, Benjamin Rush, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said that the American War has ended, but the revolution continues, and it continues to this day, and we are all a part of it. So every time you vote, every time you write your congressman, or work to improve your communities, you're carrying on the revolution that began here 227 years ago and you're adding your own meanings to the growing definition of the word liberty.